Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, I'm fascinated by the sport of boxing. At times, you wonder what's more interesting, current fights or boxing history. There's a jarring moment in the Scorsese film, The Raging Bull, where Jake LaMotta, and understand he's the author of the book, The Raging Bull. You have a good source here on what happened in LaMotta's career. Jake himself. Well, in the movie, Jake LaMotta is told by the mob that he has to throw a fight to Billy Fox. And of course, in the movie, they show how hard it was for him to do so because Billy Fox was not that good, right? So you have a fighter who's on record uh, as admitting to throwing a fight. Now let's look a little bit further back in boxing history <laughs> because I need for people to understand while it's news to many that a fighter threw a fight understand in boxing believe it or not you actually had a situation where there was a prominent fighter and I'm not talking about Sonny Liston but there's a prominent fighter who was actually mob controlled Right, that's according to the folklore. Now let's back up a bit. Tex Rickard, you might remember him. Legendary promoter, Jack Dempsey's promoter. He famously once said that featherweight champion Abe Attell, excuse me, Abe Attell was the best fighter he'd seen. If you look up Abe Attell, you'll find out that he was the featherweight champion for several years, right? Several years. Now, understand, it's an opponent of Attell's. Johnny Kilbane, who accused Attell of putting chloroform, I'm not kidding, on his gloves during a tough 20 round fight right, that Kilbane claimed was partially blinding him. Now, the story sounds preposterous until you realize that years later, that's in essence the claim that Muhammad Ali made concerning then heavyweight champion Sonny Liston, right? Understand Ali gets out to a lead, and then, of course, there's a round where Ali is blind. Sonny Liston comes in to finish him off. Ali, of course, is holding on to Liston, goes back to his corner, says to his trainer, Angelo Dundee, cut them off. I'm going to expose this bum, right? Ali claims that Liston's gloves are loaded, that there's something blinding him. And, of course, Dundee puts his finger in Ali's eye and then realizes that there's some foreign substance in Ali's eyes, right? That's during the fight. Now, it sounds preposterous until you realize that more than 50 years earlier, Abe Attell was accused by an opponent of doing the same thing, right? Well, let's look a little closer at Abe Attell, multi-year featherweight champion. Just understand that he is supposed to have been the bag man. I'm not kidding. For mobster Arnold Rothstein in Rothstein's effort to fix the 1919 World Series. Folks, if you saw this in a movie, you would think it was ridiculous. You would think the level of corruption was just not believable. Folks, understand, these were the charges that the prosecution levied on Abe Attell 
and Atel then left the country. I'm not kidding, right? He does a Jack Johnson. He leaves the country to avoid being subpoenaed. Well, baseball bans him. He's not allowed to participate in any event concerning any baseball activity by Major League Baseball. So what happens to Abe Attell? Believe it or not, he becomes the trainer for Primo Carnera, who ends up winning the heavyweight championship. Now what I want to do in this video is just talk about three Carnera fights due to the power of the internet and our ability to now look at fight films, which of course were banned from interstate commerce for years following Jack Johnson's victory on July the 4th, 1910, right? Just understand we now have film of an infamous moment in boxing history that's hotly disputed. Now, before I get to that, let's talk about Primo Carnera. I just want to mention three fights that Primo Carnera had. Right now, I don't blame Carnera. Understand legally how many of these contracts work to this day. Right? A fighter will sign a contract with a promoter or a manager and believe it or not that promoter or manager can sell that contract to someone else so primo carnera who was discovered in europe while he was a teenage strongman in a circus i'm not making this up right carnera of course at the time was huge he was six six he was a giant Understand, today in boxing, he's roughly the size of Anthony Joshua. Tyson Fury is actually bigger than Primo Carnera. But back then, he's an oddity. So Carnera is fighting tomato cans until December the 7th, 1929, when he hops in the ring with future Hall of Famer, Young Stribling. Now understand, young Stribling is supposed to have been dominating this fight, right? Stribling, of course, smaller guy than Primo Carnera. But then Carnera crumbled to the canvas. The claim was that Stribling had hit him below the waist. The referee, <laughs> the referee actually disqualified Stribling. Carnera won by disqualification. That was Carnera's biggest win to date in his career because Stribling at that point had more than 200 career wins. So then, just a few months later, right, that Stribling fight is December 7th, 1929. Fast forward to April of the next year. It's April 14th, 1930. And Carnera, who is a cash cow, right? Don't let these revisionist historical accounts fool you. He's a cash cow. So he's fighting in Emeryville, Northern California, just outside of San Francisco and Oakland. He's fighting Leon Chevalier. Right now, it's a competitive fight. Imagine watching this. It's a competitive fight. Either guy looks like they could win it. And then suddenly, the towel is thrown in by a corner. Could you imagine that? Fans are so upset that six of them attack the guy who threw in the towel. Of course, the guy who throws in the towel in Chevalier's corner isn't even the chief guy in the corner. It's some second guy who throws in the towel in a fight that the crowd felt was competitive. 
The crowd, about 10,000 people. So understand, Bedlam breaks out. An investigation takes place. The wife of the guy who threw in the towel claims that her husband was approached before the fight by unknown people who wanted a fake fight. Of course, the manager of Chevalier claims he knew nothing about that. Cardera's career continues. So then we get to the moment, and it's a big moment. New York Times estimates that 35,000 people were there. Other people put the attendance at 40,000 people. The there is a fight town, one of the premier fight towns to this day in the United States. It's Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The opponent is one of those mystical people in boxing history. You need to know him. He went by the name of George Godfrey. Years later, when Godfrey died, Jack Dempsey attended his funeral. Right? Understand, George Godfrey was actually the name used by a famous black boxer years earlier. This is back when you had color lines in boxing. So here you had a 6'3 guy, big guy, who adopts the name of a legendary black boxer. Right? He, who's black himself, calls himself George Godfrey. Right? He's actually a guy from Alabama. So in a fight on June the 23rd, 1930, that took place in Philadelphia, George Godfrey is dominating Primo Carnera over the first four rounds of the fight. Right? Carnera is not yet the heavyweight champ, but Carnera is a cash cow pulling in crowds in part because he's 6'6". Right? Even against big man Godfrey, who's bigger than Jack Johnson physically. Carnera still has a three-inch height advantage. So Carnera is getting roughed up by George Godfrey. We get to the fifth round. Now, in my favorites folder right now is the film of that fifth round. Let me be clear here. It's unclear. But just understand that there comes a moment in the fight where Carnera hits the canvas, looks completely finished, looks like he can't get up and walk. His claim is that he was hit below the belt. Right? He's on the canvas. He looks more out of it than Usyk looked when he was dropped or fouled by Daniel Dubois. Well, understand, just as in the young stribbling fight, the referee, <laughs> the referee disqualifies George Godfrey for a low blow, right? This is yet another fight that Primo Carnera is winning by disqualification. Now, what I want is for people to look at the film carefully because understand, Bedlam then broke out in Philly. You're in front of a fight crowd. This is right around the start of the Great Depression, right? You're just out of the Roaring Twenties. People are there, at least 35,000 people are there. And they wanted to see an honest fight. So Bedlam breaks out in the crowd. But of course, because of that Johnson-Jim Jeffries rule that these fight films weren't allowed to be transported interstate, a lot of people didn't see the film. They couldn't judge whether Carnera had actually been hit below the belt. Now I want people to look at this film carefully. Unfortunately, 
It's 1930. And it's not like they have film angles everywhere. This isn't like watching a Super Bowl where they can look at it from the east, they can look at it from the west, they can look at it from the overhead cam. No, no, no. You have one fight film, and unfortunately, it's from behind Primo Carnera. So you can't see what's happening in front of him. What's clear is that George Godfrey is giving him the business. Then, of course, Carnera falls. One thing is clear. Godfrey doesn't dip a shoulder. The low blow couldn't have been that low. You have to ask yourself, too, and I think every man has been in this position before, where you get hit uh, below the belt, right? It could be in a fight. It could be playing sports. It could be just, you know, getting out the car the wrong way and bumping into the door. I know how painful it can be. I'm sure most of the guys watching this video know how painful it could be. But you need to ask yourself, looking at Primo Cardera on the canvas, <laughs> could it be that painful? Right, Cardera, 6'6", athlete, he can barely move. Right, and you see it and you're thinking, oh my goodness. You know, at worst, this may have been Bernard Hopkins against Joe Calzaghe. At worst. Well, give it a look. Just to understand that Primo Carnero goes on to win the heavyweight championship. Just to understand that his trainer is Abe Attell, who, of course, <laughs> was banned from baseball. Just to understand that we know that his contract was owned by the mob. Just to understand that he won multiple fights by claiming he was hit below the belt, right? As you look at the footage too, assess his skills. I have no doubt that Anthony Joshua would have made quick work of Primo Carnera, right? Carnera is painfully slow in the video, right? I have another video that highlights Carnera's five best knockouts. Just take a look at that, just to understand that this was a guy pulling crowds. Another Carnera fight had a crowd greater than 55,000 people. So you had a world that was dealing with a economic downturn after a gaga 1920s. You had a athlete who people were mesmerized by his size, right? They called Jack Johnson the Galveston Giant. And Jack Johnson wasn't even 6'2". Here you had a guy who was 6'6". Right? Just understand that his trainer was banned from baseball. Had to flee the country during the Black Sox scandal. Right? Just understand that this guy wasn't the best fighter. He didn't make it that far in his later fight against Joe Lewis. Just understand that boxing was so... How do we put it? Bob influenced that you have later generations people like Jake LaMotta openly talking about being pushed into throwing fights right you have you know Sonny Liston at one point breaking a cop's leg not making this up and somehow serving not a long time in prison. Because Liston, who was actually called to testify before Congress, right, history seems to have forgotten that, is supposed to have had mob connections. Right? There are pictures of Joe Lewis with, I believe he's Blinky Palermo, Right, Lewis and several Hall of Famers. With Blinky, I don't believe Lewis was mob controlled. But what I do believe is that the mob was such a big part of the sport <laughs> that, you know, even the clean guys 
had to, you know, take photos with them, recognize that they were involved in some events, right? I want people to look at today's modern boxing. You have a lot of very high level, I'm not going to say a single name, but you have a lot of very high level guys who, of course, were involved in a business sense in terms of, um, you know, getting paid by someone who was so mob related that they were not allowed to travel to the United States, right? Do your own due diligence. Understand it's the kind of situation where people have to be very careful in how they word sentences because we have defamation laws and proving the obvious sometimes is difficult to do, right? But just be mindful of the fact that we now have film that for viewers of this video are just a few clicks away that will enable you to go back and look at many of Primo Carnera's controversial fights, right? Take a look at the George Godfrey fight. Let me tell you what happened. So Godfrey, one of the heavyweight division's better fighters, a guy who was bigger than most heavyweights, a guy who was highly skilled, a guy who was highly thought of. Because of the disqualification to Primo Carnera, then was off the main stage. Had to reboot his career. Instead of being in position to fight for the heavyweight championship, which Primo Carnera later does, beating Jack Sharkey, who, by the way, look him up, right? His name wasn't Jack Sharkey in real life. Understand, he claims this is a guy who was heavyweight champion. He claims he threw some fights, right? Well, just understand, George Godfrey was on his way to beating Primo Carnera, he ends up getting disqualified, never quite makes it back to where he was. You, thanks to YouTube, now have access to the video of the fight that led to Godfrey's disqualification. Anyway, those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this YouTube video. Please, research not just Primo Carnera, but research young Stribling, who does not make it to 30, right? He's killed in a motor vehicle accident. He was on a motorcycle. Boxers are dear devils, right? Uh, he's still in the Hall of Fame. It's a shame that he wasn't able to fight on into the early 30s. I also want you to look up Abe Attell. Understand, he was a masterful boxer held a world title for something like 10 years. But even a great boxer like this ended up intertwined, if you believe the folklore, with gamblers. And of course, these mobsters needed an in with baseball players. If you believe that Abe Attell was that in, then the people he was dealing with would have understood that they were dealing with a world champion boxer. In other words, he would have had that extra glow. You know, you're a baseball player, someone comes up to you, they want you to throw the biggest set of games in the big leagues, the World Series. But of course, the guy happens to be Naoa Inoue. <laughs> right? Some guy you think you know, Bam Rodriguez. Right, some guy you think you know because you've read about him. This is before TV. You read about him. You know he's a world champion. He's been champion for years. He's won some big fights. Well, just understand that guy ends up being Primo Carnera's trainer. Think about that. After he's banned from baseball. After, of course... He left the country to avoid being subpoenaed in the Black Sox scandal, 
right? For those keeping track too, believe it or not, Arnold Rothstein himself was not indicted. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this YouTube video. Let's just say that boxing has an extremely rich history. Some very interesting characters. Thanks for stopping by.